So in response to this growing problem of patrician um, sort of lack of consideration for this, the situation the plebeians found them in, um, what we might call patrician neglect, um, the, the plebeians eventually start to organize their own system of governance, a kind of almost shadow um, set of offices that allowed them some role in the governance of Rome. And the evolution of the relationship between these plebeian offices and those that originally were held solely by patricians is a long story. It happens very gradually over the, case, the course of the Republic, um, and many of the details are lost to us. But what we can talk about is just the establishment of these offices. Most importantly is the office of the Tribune of the Plebs. And we'll be coming back to this office several times in subsequent lectures. Um, in rough terms, the Tribune of the Plebs is sort of the equivalent of the consul. Um, he's a leader of the plebeians. He's elected. Um, and among the different things that the Tribune of the Plebs could do, perhaps most important, was his job in protecting his fellow plebeians from abuse by the patricians. So he could actually step in physically if it was required and protect somebody from being beaten. Um, but certainly in legal cases, for instance, um, the Tribune of the Plebs could come in and protect um, a plebeian who is being unlawfully prosecuted. The body of the Tribune was sacrosanct. And what that meant was that it was illegal to attack it, um, to touch it. And so this is why the Tribune could physically place himself in the middle of a, a, a beating, as it were, um, and, and stop that beating. Um, he could also convene meetings of the Senate. Um, this is an important uh, um, skill, um, um, ability, that allows the, the Tribune then to um, exercise significant power. Um, so he forces the Senate to meet and to deliberate over proposals that the Tribune brings before them. Um, this will become, again, in increasingly important as we get to the late Republic, where, in fact, someone could hold the office of the Tribune as a way of circumventing the consulship. Um, he was assisted by plebeian ediles. Um, the ediles had various jobs. Um, some of them were just to look after um, the maintenance of the city, just as the, the um, patrician ediles would do. Um, we also see the plebeians establishing their own religious cults. Um, their cult center seems to have been around the goddess um, Ceres, the goddess of the harvest, um, not surprisingly. And they build an, a, a temple to Ceres and have a cult center on the Aventine Hill. So whereas the center of the patrician class was on the Palatine Hill, for the patrician, for the uh, um, plebeians, it's on the Aventine Hill. And again, this will, will play an important part um, when we get to the Gracchi brothers. Um, and we'll see that the Aventine Hill is a kind of refuge for plebeians who are being attacked by patricians. Um, but the sort of basic point here is that the plebeians start to respond to being shut out of office, um, both political office and religious office, by creating their own. Um, and over time, these plebeian offices will in fact have significant power in Roman governance. It's also the case, and the details of this are, are sketchy, um, so we're, we're really speculating, but in the mid-4th century and into the 3rd centuries BC, more and more political offices that were originally restricted to patricians are now open to plebeians. And we know this because we have lists of office holders. And in some cases, it seems fairly clear that some of the office holders are in fact plebeians, um, that they come from families that we're pretty sure are plebeian families. What's a little bit uncertain is whether that particular office holder might have been an exception, that he was a patrician. Um, so it's a little bit complicated to try to trace 
this opening of offices to plebeians based on these names. But with some security, we feel confident that, in fact, these offices were open to plebeians, um, certainly by the third century BC. Um, one example of this um, is the fact that eventually one consul was required to be a plebeian, um, and at times we'll have both consuls be plebeians. Um, the praetor, um, who is sort of second in command, could be a plebeian. So by the third century, we see these offices being opened up, and part of this is just the natural evolution that the patrician class is no longer, it's, it's been a significant amount of time since Romulus, um, that it's become diluted and it needs to look outside for talent. And it's just a natural evolution that it's recognizing that talent is going to come as much from the plebeians, if not more, than from these, these hereditary um, patricians who may themselves by the third century be kind of losers. Um, their ancestors may have been great, but they themselves might not be so great, um, may, may not be so fit for rule. So we see in this evolution also this, no, this um, strong Roman idea that really office holding at the end of the day is not about birth, but it's about being um, fit for office. It's about showing your talent. So in some sense, it's more of a meritocracy. Um, it's still the case that plebeian dissatisfactions persist um, they persist all the way through the Republic. And in fact, when we get to the very late Republic, when we're talking about Sulla, Marius, Julius Caesar, Pompey, men like that, one of the hallmark features is the way that these, these charismatic military leaders are able to use both the offices of the plebeians, but also just the dissatisfactions of the plebeians to their advantage, um, to challenge the the um, sort of tip the the standard forms of governance, um, and so the plebeians become a, a significant body as the late republic proceeds, um, in part just because they're dissatisfied with not having full access um, to offices. So the voting system of Rome. Um, it operates on a principle known as the citizens' assembly. Um, and importantly, though, Rome was not a pure democracy. Um, so there is this, this thing that's called the citizens' assembly that's effectively a gathering of the Roman citizens who um, are present in Rome, and they would cast their vote. You had to be pr physically present to cast a vote. You couldn't cast an absentee vote. Um, this will come to matter as Rome expands citizenship beyond the city itself. Um, but this wasn't a pure democracy in the sense that every vote counted equally. It was much more of a system of representation that was quite complicated. So again, like an, our American voting system, where when we elect a president, every vote doesn't count equally. It's not the popular vote that matters, it's the electoral vote. Um, well, Rome operated similarly with a kind of electoral vote. Um, the censors, um, who the censor was an office holder in the Republic, um, and he was responsible for assigning all citizens to what were called centuries. Um, these were not necessarily made up of a hundred men. Um, in fact, many of them were much, much larger. Um, and these centuries were based on wealth. So the century you were assigned to depended on what your possessions or what your wealth was. Um, and they were, as I said, very different sizes. The smallest centuries were the wealthiest citizens. The largest centuries, so you know, tens of thousands, were the poorest citizens. And then voting in the citizens' assembly would proceed by century. And it would start with these small, rich centuries and proceed down to the enormous, poor centuries. And very often, the voting was decided, the outcome was already decided before those large, poor centuries were ever reached. So you can see in this how particularly poor plebeians would feel like they had been left out of this, this democracy, that their vote didn't really matter. Very often, they didn't even cast a vote. And here we have, um, that just came up on your slide on the left-hand side, 
um, a coin that's actually showing a Roman citizen casting his vote. Um, so you can see sort of the, the tablet that he's placing um, down in this container. And this was how a vote was cast. Um, the, the sentries would decide on what they were voting for, who they were voting for, um, what position they were going to take on a, on a legislative matter, and the vote would be cast. So finally, warfare. Um, we've been talking a lot in passing about Roman military conflicts, about the pressures that, that Rome was feeling, particularly in the fifth century, uh, and the increasing demands on the Roman citizenry to maintain its, its defense system um, by sending many of its citizens out to war. Warfare was a regular part of Roman life. Um, it, it was just in, completely integrated into the, the yearly cycle. Um, and it served a, a significant social function and political function. Um, it wasn't just about defense. It was also a way that a soldier could demonstrate his virtue, his bravery. And in, in Latin, the word um, from which we derive virtue is virtus. Um, and it literally means something like manliness. Um, but it's, it's where a Roman showed that he was a real man, quite, quite um, um, truly. And it's also where he showed that he was fit for holding political office. There was a close connection between showing bravery on the battlefield and being electable. Um, the, the armies were led by consuls. So if you, you know, were a wimpy consul, you weren't going to be a very effective general of an army. And you were kind of expected to lead the army literally, to go out in front. Um, to go directly into the, the, the enemy's line of battle. Um, hanging out in the back and giving orders was not really considered very brave of a consul. Um, and so it was really important that if you were going to be elected consul, that you had demonstrated that you were qualified for that job. Um, but also for other offices in, in Roman governance. Um, the, the bravery on the battlefield was extremely important. And again, you can think of the ways that in election years, um, in the past at least, various candidates would call on their, their military service as evidence for their fitness to fight. And, and similarly, their opponents would criticize their military service to claim that they weren't fit to fight. So um, one of the sort of great examples of that is, is John Kerry and the swift boat attacks, um, where he was, he, was clay, he was described as being cowardly. Um, on the other side of it, when John McCain was running for president, his time as a, as a captive in Vietnam and his bravery in the face of that um, was really held up as, you know, this is a guy who can, who can work under pressure. Um, as we now enter a phase where many of our candidates have never served in the military, um, and in fact, our, our current presidential election will, will um, feature two such candidates. That element will be missing. But for the most part, up until very recently, it was also an important feature of American politics. Um, in Rome, the campaigns were yearly. As I said, the consuls would lead them. And it was expected that all citizens would make themselves available for military service. Now. Not all citizens could do so. You had to be able to supply your own armor, your own weaponry. Um, there wasn't a state-funded you know, supply of swords and bows and arrows. So you had to have enough extra wealth that you could actually supply those things. But it was expected, if you could do that, that you did do that. And every year, the consul would hold what was called a levy, um, where he would choose out which citizens he wanted to fight in his army that year. And it was a privilege to be chosen. Um, and so this is why you can see, you know, these veterans that come back feel like they've kind of been betrayed by Rome um, when they're then enslaved because of debt. Um, the, the campaigns were seasonal, so there wasn't a standing army. Um, the standing army comes a little bit later, but in the fifth century, it's really seasonal, and the campaigns would begin, interestingly, before the grain harvest, so usually in early summer, late spring, early summer, 
um, is when you would, would make your forays out into whatever town you were going to attack. Um, the soldiers would live off the land, and so they would go into enemy territory and then graze on the crops. And this had a couple of functions. One, it meant that r the um, city of Rome didn't need to worry about supply lines. It didn't need to provide food. Um, but it also had the secondary function of depriving the territory that it was invading of their own food, not allowing them to harvest. And so it therefore weakened that city. Um, it was a form of, of attack. And so you would never have to, you could even inhabit a city never fighting a single battle but just eating all their food. Um, and that would then force famine. It would force, it would put that city under a lot of pressure. Um, the soldiers would return home in the winter time and they would stay at home long enough to plant their own crops um, in the spring. And then the cycle would continue. But of course, if they're off fighting and if they don't have enough relatives at home to harvest the crop, you can see how this would quickly lead to a cycle of debt for those that are chosen to fight in the armies. The end result of this style of warfare in the 5th century is that there were few permanent results. Um, these were not military occupations. These weren't even really sophisticated campaigns. They're really just forays, um, raids almost, um, that are meant to cause problems for neighboring towns, occasionally to occupy territory, to seize goods. But these aren't really intended to sort of permanently bring these, these neighboring cities under the control of Rome. So in this process of warfare and talking about the virtues that, that accumulated to a soldier, um, one of the most famous examples of sort of the noble soldier um, is Cincinnatus. Um, and Cincinnatus is remembered as a great hero of the patricians. Um, and also this model of Roman simplicity and virtue, of courage. Um, what he does is he exchanges the axe and rods of the dictator for the plow. Um, so in a time of crisis, Cincinnatus was appointed dictator. So not consul, but actually dictator. When Rome needed to go fight a, an invading enemy. But, and Cincinnatus was just a simple farmer um, who spent most of his time plowing his land. But when called upon by his city, he shows his courage, his um, willingness to sacrifice his own livelihood for the defense of the city by taking up the, the ax and rods of the dictator. And in the slide on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see that in one hand, he's holding the ax and rods of the dictator. So they're bound together. You can see the head of the ax with those rods. And then, um, and so that's in his right hand. And then in his left hand, down on the bottom, he's got the, the plow. Um, and what he's particularly celebrated for is his willingness to take up the ax and rods when necessary but also when it was no longer necessary to put them down and take up the plow, to return to his livelihood as a farmer. And this is what, for, for at least um, Romans of the, the sixth, the fifth century, this was the model soldier. It wasn't somebody who was a permanent lifelong soldier. It was somebody who was really just a farmer who when his city called on him could become a soldier and a virtuous one at that. 